Thank you everybody for joining. My name is Michael Guyatt. I am a member of the ETF think tank at Title Financial Group. We help bring ETFs to market, uh, and we work with thought leaders like Lachman Lach here, uh, talking about markets, macro, uh, how to think about asset allocation, and in general, what in the world to do with the unknowable tomorrow. Uh, I want to have my colleagues introduce themselves before we get into the macro environment, and we'll start off with my friend, Mr. Dan Weisskopf. Yeah, hi everybody, Dan Weisskopf, the ETF professor, also co-portfolio manager of Block, and also lead ETF strategist for the ETF think tank. Um, really looking forward to a discussion. I have to do one quick plug. I always find it amazing when I hear from financial advisors, no, we're good with our due diligence. We don't need help. Gary. David, you're up. How's it going, everyone? David Chikansky here, fellow portfolio manager within the Title Financial Group, focusing on one of our growth-oriented and inflation-oriented ETFs. Very excited to talk all things macroeconomic cycles with Lakshman. Um, I believe I pronounced that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, uh, an author in this space as well. Lakshman, if you wouldn't mind, please introduce yourself to the crowd. Sure, sure. Uh, hello, everybody. It's good to be back. It's It's been a little while since uh, we got together. And uh, my name's Lakshman Achathan. I'm co-founder of the Economic Cycle Research Institute, um, which began uh, in the mid-90s. And before that, uh, we were part of a research institute at Columbia University called the Center for International Business Cycle Research, or CIBCR. I don't think that would be a great, that's a longer ticker. It might not fit like a, <laughs> but, but um, it's as you, as you're, as both of those names say, it's all about, for us, all about cycles. Um, and um, back in 1990, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I was getting out of school and uh, trying to figure out what to do. And instead of going down to Wall Street, which is where I was headed, I went up to Columbia to work with Jeffrey Moore on business cycles and leading indicators. And I found it fascinating. You were talking about, I think, Michael, right at the beginning, what's what's going to happen tomorrow? Like, where are we headed? All this guessing of where things are going. And um, it is a very complex system. Let's acknowledge that. And then when we get into just in general, the world, and then when we get into the, the economy and markets, it's, it's pretty complex. There's a lot of things pushing around. And I was really struck by um, more cyclical approach because it was very much uh, rooted in market oriented economies. So command economies, uh, other types of, of structures for economies, it, cycles don't really present themselves the way that we're going to talk about them today. But if your economy, whichever one around the world, is dominated by free market activity, then these cycles uh, the, are, are, are part and parcel of, of, the, of the swimming pool that you're in. And so trying to understand the ebb and the flow, is the wind in your face, is the wind at your back, is it going to change direction? That's really what these cycle indicators are about. And it's a very different approach um, than uh, the traditional approach. I say the, the, the conventional approach, which is uh, a, go a good approach. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just a different tool. It's uh, a model building approach. It might be a bigger, these days, a bigger data approach, uh, sophisticated extrapolating of trends. You know, what, what's happened recently you know, can I guess based on that, is it going to happen tomorrow? Um, and and that's a, a perfectly good tool in between turning points. Um, can kind of help you with magnitudes. It's a very good way to use it. Um, but for trying to figure out is the direction going to change and go the other way, not so good. That's where it's kind of pretty, that's the weak spot. And so you want to pick up a different tool, and that's this leading indicator or cyclical approach in terms of kind of what I've seen uh, and, and learned. And and there's nothing like living through a turning point in real time when you're focused. I mean, we've all lived through them, but we not we might not have all been focused on what was going on. And so uh, in 1990, uh, I just happened to time it right and and show up here with Moore and start working with my, my mentor, Jeffrey Moore. And a recession was happening. And it was a recession that nobody 
saw coming. Uh, Dr. Moore saw it, um, but using uh, these types of indicators. But the market had thought that we had dodged a bullet uh, and that the recession risk uh, was receding. Um, and, and I do remember I was like carrying Dr. Moore's briefcase or something to a, to a lunch downtown. Back then it was at Citibank. They were still big back then. And uh, we were doing a lunch down in Wall Street. Dr. Moore is the talking and he's, and he's giving them the lowdown to some clients. And uh, he says, yeah, there's going to, and he was not an exciting speaker. He was a pretty sedate speaker, like, like a sleeping pill. He put you to sleep, especially if you had a, a, a big lunch or something. And so he's just kind of mumbling down and down. He goes, yeah, there's going to be a recession. And then he's like, okay, let's go. And, and I'm walking out the door and everybody's like, what did he say? Did he just really say recession? I'm like, yeah, you know, he knows what he's doing. Uh, <laughs> you should listen to him. And so those kind of moments can really solidify for you that real, you know, your own personal experience around these turning points, how useful these tools can be. All right. So All right. That was a long intro, but. No, no, that's great. No. <laughs> so, so I always say that um, the problem with cycles is you don't know if you're in a new one until like two to three years after. Uh, ready underway, right? Um, in your work, I am curious to hear your thoughts on cycle changes and uh, how that correlates to oil prices. Oh. So I have to tell you, I think it's interesting what's happening. And this is more short term, but oil prices are breaking pretty heavy. Uh, mm -hmm. and expectations are correlated to that. Um, who knows if it sticks, but um, what does cycle work say about major trend changes when it comes to oil? Okay, so very important indicator, right? It's a real economy indicator. There's plenty of speculation in it, uh, but it's it's actually used. We all use it uh, right now. We're using it. Um, and it's in our world, right? This is going to, oil is going to fit uh, inside of sen sensitive industrial materials prices. And sensitive industrial mater materials prices um, exclude uh, agriculture and precious metals. So those put them to the side, uh, even though you can have some industrial uses for precious metals, we'll just put them to the side. So it's going to be your energy, um, textiles, um, uh, uh, some primary metals, and uh, some other miscellaneous sensitive industrial prices. And those together um, are good uh, indicators of where you are in global industrial growth. So a couple of quick definitional things, I'll just assert them real quick. I'm happy to go down the details for you, but you can have a, a cycle in the United States in, in the economy. You can have a cycle in the UK or in Germany or Japan or China, uh, maybe even in a region, uh, like Europe. Um, but there is no global business cycle. Uh, however, uh, and, and part of this is because services is a little hard to trade. Some of them are con you know, consumed locally and, and real estate stuff and construction stuff doesn't really move around that much, hopefully. So it's really that manufactured stuff where you can have a global um, cycle. So it's, 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 it's something that we can observe. We can have a target. And now sensitive industrial materials prices are linked to that global industrial cycle. Very specifically, I would look at growth rates um, in global uh, industrial production growth as a, as a good way of getting a, a read on global industrial cycles, manufacturing cycles. And there you can have one area lead another by a month or two, maybe a quarter, but they're pretty tied up maybe in some extremes, uh, a couple of quarters, but they're roughly synch synchronized. And you know why we're, we're early. Some of us are commodity producers. Some of us produce components. Some of us do final assembly. We, we do all of these things globally and commodity prices are an, are, are an early input. So they can have a very, very short lead over global industrial growth. Um, now they'll deviate when speculation gets in there, it tends to 
it, it can't get in all sensitive industrial materials prices, but it can get in the ones that are traded more easily. And um, so you'll have some deviations here and there, but they it's very hard to break off the cycle. So now you have, um, let's say, you, Michael, Michael, you were saying, uh, oh, oil's weak, right? And it's not for lack of trying, right? They're pulling back supply if they can, but it's still happening. So what gives, and there is, there are these strong cyclical forces. Um, you've had, um, I mean, let's, it's, it's like ancient history, but it was at the beginning of this year, 23, when everybody was getting happy about China opening up, right? And that this was going to suck up all the commodities and help oil and all the, you know, the story, and it didn't happen. For a whole host of reasons. So, so China's still weak. Europe, of course, uh, parts of it went into recession. Um, the U.S. Uh, had a lot less goods consumption. Uh, I think there were some one-off, some non-cyclical things that were happening in the U.S. to support some manufacturing activity. But by and large, there's cyclical downside for global industrial growth. That'll that'll turn and go the other way at some point, um, but. Uh, right now, it seems like it still needs to kind of flush out a little bit. But when when you look at the price action of oil, and I think maybe this is what Michael was referring to, it to me there were two questions that I would ask you. One, you know, what are the leading indicators that you are looking at to, um, in your work, assess? where oil is going right mm -hmm. you know because it, it's an important component to do the economic cycle and then what is the price of oil telling you as a future indicator perhaps of where we are in the cycle because a week to me in my experience a weak energy price would suggest that well you know what there's softness in the economy yeah yeah, yeah. um where you're not going to get argument with me on the last point. I, I think there is softness in the economy. Look, I think um, you, you had, you had, um, so you had China mechanistically pop out of recession when they uh, got rid of the, 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 the lockdown. So you have a little pop and then that fades, right? Cause it was a mechanistic pop. Hey, we can go outside, but there wasn't a lot of follow through because it wasn't a real cyclical upturn. Um, there, there wasn't this kind of virtuous cycle building in terms of demand. Um, then you had Europe have a little bit of a relief because they didn't have this freezing, um, you know, they didn't have a horrible winter last year and that was a big fear. And so you had a tiny bit of relief there. So you had both China lift up, Europe lift up, they both rolled over. Okay. Then you come over to the U S we had a lift. Right, our forward-looking indicators, which are looking nasty, in in twenty two, um, they kind of stop falling, and just by the virtue of math, the growth rates get less and less bad into twenty three. So you have a little bit of a lift here, and you have the YOLO summer and the revenge spending and whatever you want to call it, the switch over to services, all that pent up demand, all of that has happened. And my kids would like me to tell you Taylor Swift did a concert, you know, and, and so all that stuff happened. And and um, now those forward looking indicators uh, in the U.S. Uh, are softening up. OK, so the soft landing narrative uh, implicitly implies some reacceleration on the other side. Uh, that's not showing up in the forward data. OK. So now come back to oil, because what I've described is China up, then down, Europe up, then down, U.S. up, then down in sequence. So they're not exactly lined up. And so there's a little bit of overlap of demand there. But when you add the whole thing up, I think the global industrial cycle, especially if the U.S. slow down intensifies, um, may have a little bit more bouncing along the bottom to do. Uh, before uh, we get some firming. Now, mind you, the reality is that the banks, by and large, central banks, have tightened. And uh, there's lots of, of conclusions being made about that they're all going to ease. 
Um, and you know, we'll see, but we all, we also know that regardless of what they do, if they cut, if they hold, whatever they do, um, and I'm talking Europe as well, then you, you still are dealing with that lag effect that is seeping through and propagating through all of our economies. And, um, that's not over. It just doesn't work that way. Uh, and it takes a while to, to, to turn the ship. And so it's, so I, I just want to clarify, oil prices are a very short leading indicator of global industrial growth. So they're just, they're not exactly coincident, very short leading. Uh, so that implies a little more downside just from that indicator from leading indicators of the global industrial cycle. There are glimmers of, you know, light at the end of the tunnel stuff, but you can have a, a, you know, we're not clear exactly what's the ditch in between here and there. Um, so I would hesitate to say, okay, we're oil has had its come down and it's over. I don't think we know that just yet. Oil's uh, short-term movements could also be somewhat correlated to a lack of like expectation of further global geopolitical instability. Mm -hmm. um, that was at a moment of time where if it yeah. had gotten worse, it could get a whole lot worse. There's also rumors that the government's trying to get uh, Taylor Swift to have babies to rever <laughs> single-handedly reverse the demographic issues we're seeing in our countries and start a new trend of family creation in the U.S. Uh, country. We could, use, we could uh, use that. All of these things I'm going to say now are going to sound like I'm a bull, but I actually very much believe, uh, agree with you that the economy will be slowing down. But in the face of strong GDP, while China didn't come out of the gates of their COVID really strong, they're doing more like of their own QE right now. Biden's talking about more uh, 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 student loan forgiveness, right? There's all these other mm -hmm. markets of like extended QE. And so like mm -hmm. for me, 2024 is like, well, politicians want good um, stock market, right, in political cycles, and and Powell's going to be, you know, trying to fight inflation as as much as possible. And it like, how does how do those collide? And how do you see like this strong GDP GDP we're experiencing? Right. Um. Like, where does that like fit in with this narrative? Sure. So, so with the strong GDP, I want to I want to talk about. Uh, kind of what happened in, in 23 in the, in, in this, in the earlier part of this year. But I also want to be sure to talk. So that's cycles in growth. And, but I also want to be sure to talk about cycles and in inflation, uh, which are different than cycles and growth. I don't think, you know, I'm kind of now I've been doing this for several decades. I'm used to kind of carrying these two cycles separately and walking around with them. A lot of people aren't built that way. Models certainly aren't built that way. They put the two together. And I think that can make things extra confusing. They're confusing enough, but I think it can make it extra confusing. And realizing that cycles and inflation are separate than cycles and growth, um, it's a little more complicated, but it actually adds some clarity to what's going on. So, David, you were saying, okay, they're going to, throw out some more money. That's what they do. That's everybody's reflex. So, hey, I'll, I'll do some fiscal spend. I'll do some QE. And certainly they have done more than I would have expected over the last decade plus, right? Since the GS, global financial crisis in 2008. And they were, they, meaning policymakers, were able to pull those levers because inflation was low. That is not really the environment we're in, right? So we've we've had a come down in rates recently, okay, but we're we're we, we may be in a different run environment where you've got this inflation, and so it's going to be a lot tougher to pull those levers if if you borrow an extra trillion, right? Your debt service uh, goes up, and it affects all the earlier stuff you borrowed too. Uh, and so that becomes real money in terms of running a country or something. And from the, right. So, so you have this bond vigilante, I, I don't know if you guys will remember the bond vigilantes in the nineties, right. That would be active and kind of hold the government to account. 
And it was a big deal in the 90s. And is that coming back or not? We don't exactly know. I think that's an open question for us to debate, but it may make it difficult for some of those levers to be pulled. Although I guarantee you, that's part of the playbook that's active, right? Because that's what kind of successfully was done over the last decade. Now, and, and on that score, we have inflation coming down in the inflation cycle, but you've introduced this pretty sticky part for some structural reasons and other reasons in wage inflation, non, I mean, serv services uh, inflation uh, and services wage inflation. And that stuff is difficult to, to, to knock down. Uh, and that's got to be a concern of Powell's, regardless of whatever the jawboning is. And the reason that becomes a very, very big issue is because inflation is indeed cyclical. It cycles down. A really important question, let's say you get the soft landing, which I don't think is the likely outcome, but let's just say that you do. Then now you, you may have to deal with the cyclical trough and in inflation being higher than it was in the earlier cycle. And that pattern can start to, to develop where you're having inflation cycles, but the bottom troughs in your inflation cycle are moving up. So in the, in this like 69 to early eighties, I think, uh, inflation cycles from under 3% to over 13%. That's the swing of the cycle, the sine wave, right? Average is 7%. Whole bunch of different reasons why, but we could, we could go through and we could spend the whole time talking about all the structural reasons for inflation now on top of which we've got an inflation cycle, which if the bottom in this inflation cycle ends up being higher than earlier, you start to get into some trouble with bond vigilantes maybe, right? So you don't want, like that's the fight that I don't think anybody on the policy side really wants to pick if they can avoid it. Going back to GDP, the strong GDP and growth, what's happened since, what has happened this year, right? What's happened this year? A lot of people have said, oh, that recession that we all expected, including us, didn't happen. Oh, you guys are wrong. First, I'm not entirely sure. You you, you need to wait for the dust to settle. Um, second, uh, when we look inside, and we, we've torn apart every index, I've got dozens of indexes for the U.S. When you look inside, out here, the, the story is fairly straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. All the cyclical stuff. Boom, down. The, all the cyclical impulse is very strong to the downside. And it's been offset by what I would call non-cyclical items. Okay. One is, a big one, uh, is the kind of structural sh whatever hit that the labor market took with COVID, where you lost a bunch of people, like a lot of people. And so labor market's super tight. And you know all the stories around that. Second is that, and there's still a cyclical hollowing out of the labor market, which I'll, I'll touch on in a second. But the second non-cyclical thing that has happened is, um, David, as you were saying, the fiscal spend, right? So you have these huge fiscal spends. You can see it really clearly in non-residential construction. So typically in a recession, uh, your job losses are from the goods sector going to be from construction and manufacturing services actually may not even lose jobs like that's it's not this you can have plenty of recessions where they don't lose jobs you just slow down so here we're we have a a, a labor shortage and you're you've got this fiscal hunk of demand on non-residential construction so with all the leading indicators of that sector going down the coincident data just hockey sticks up right after the money gets come, gets freed up. Uh, and I think that contributed a nice hunk to Q3, right? and maybe even to Q2. Uh, and the question now, and I'm willing to be schooled on this, are they going to do it again? <laughs> I, I mean, I don't, I don't envision it. It doesn't seem like there's a consensus on on spending money like that uh, again, but maybe there is. Uh, but it would take something like that to really push back against these cyclical forces, which are very clear and evident. If you look at the jobs market, as tight as it is, temporary jobs, 
uh, have fallen on the order of 7%. They're gone. You know, they're cutting them all. Uh, work week. I pulled that in. I don't want to fire people, but I pulled in my work week quite a bit. If you look at the types of jobs that are growing and the types that aren't, it's all the non-cyclical jobs uh, that are growing, like education and healthcare, stuff that you can't really say no to. Um, but the discretionary stuff is all slowing down exactly the way you would expect it to. So, um, it seems like, it seems like the cycle is, is as, as, as crazy as it is. And with, look, 5.2% real GDP growth in Q3 is a big number. There's no way around that. Um, still, uh, the coincident data, which includes GDP, industrial production, income, sales, and jobs. The growth rate has come down, it's below 2%, and it's trending down. It's not going up. So I, I recently wrote about the coincidental um, data, and, and my question to you was going to be, are you focused, you're in the U.S., by state that and that, at that level? And then if you are, great. How do you look at globally? Do you get that granular as well? Um, we're, we're not at the state level. We've had like New York city leading index and things like that. Cause we're based in New York city. Uh, and they have a little extra data, but, um, no, we're, we're national, but what we do for the United States is we will look at uh, key sectors of activity. So not regional sectors, but things like manufacturing uh, or construction. And construction could be residential or non-residential. We could look at, uh, we have uh, cycles in overall services, financial services, non-financial services, um, trade, uh, home prices, um, so in that sense, we can slice up and see different patterns in the cycles of the sectors of activity, but not, um, it's not really going to be Northeast or, or Southwest or those kind of regional things. Uh, and then when we go globally, uh, a, a really interesting feature, which is what hooked me in 1990 is that these are comparable across borders if it's done correctly. So the leading indicator growth rate for the United States is comparable to a leading uh, index for the Eurozone or for the UK or for, or for Japan, or we also have for the emerging markets, the first indicators for India and China and Brazil and South Africa and even Russia. And, uh, but Russia, just industrial, just industrial production, uh, cycles there. Um, and those aggregate indicators are quite they, they could tell you, they're, first, they're really esoteric. So it's not, and that's part of the thing, right? So we're all trying to look ahead and we're all reading all the data flow that's coming over us. And, you know, we're probably seeing things other people are seeing. So it's like, if you have a unique framework, you might have some insight, but otherwise you're trying to somehow distill all the stuff that you're hearing. And and some of these global indicators can be quite interesting because it's a it's a very clear, well thought out framework of coincident and leading and long leading indicators. They're designed in a way where I'm going to assert they're not being fitted to the data because we don't want uh, the risk of that. We really are, are looking at the relationship at the inflection points and everything I'm talking about here, the strength of what I'm talking about is the inflection point. So I, I laid a breadcrumb earlier. I said, hey, in a soft landing narrative, let's just assert that's the narrative, right? It, there, there's some implication in there that uh, certainly that magnitude-wise you're not going negative, but that there's an acceleration, a reacceleration on the other side. I can, so that's a directional call. So I'm going to translate that into, hey, there's some 
call of an upturn out there somewhere. The soft landing implies an upturn out there. These indicators, I know they're really good at turning points. They're not showing us that. So uh, is, is everybody seeing something that all these indicators that have worked for three generations over 22 economies, are they seeing something that these indicators are missing? You know, I don't think so, but I'm willing to be, I'm willing to learn, but I, I just don't see it. Um, and, and, uh, one of the things that those indicators are, are popping up, which will really put a fly in the ointment later. And, and I just don't know that this is going to, it's not a strong view. It's a suspicion is that, uh, the same way we have leading indicators for growth, we have leading indicators for inflation. Okay. And, the and, and a big part of what we're dealing with now, and I think we should spend five minutes on it, is is that the the confusion around inflation cycles and how it's interacting with policy, which is something David mentioned earlier. But these global leading inflation indicators, um, all of a sudden, they got a little bit of traction. Now, that's not on anyone's radar screen, and and they're they're longer leading. Okay, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. Uh, but it's something that we need to start thinking about uh, and watching for. Uh, because the narrative is is rife with 100% chance of all these rate cuts in the U.S. and in Europe uh, coming to a neighborhood soon, right? And and it, it I'm not, you know, there, there may be another path here. I'm not sure. Uh, and so we need to watch that very, very closely. And again, that will um, definitely be something that bond market vigilantes would be interested in. And I think those uh, bond market vigilantes are, are uh, from my understanding, the hedge fund world very short. The ten year going into heavy issuance week next week. So I'm going to play devil's advocate on a couple of your points here. Sure. Uh, one is like this time is different versus the three last generations, mainly because there's a surplus of assets on the uh, residential and corporate balance sheet and less so on the government balance sheet. And so the actual fact of short-term interest rates is not actually slowing down the economy. It's actually fueling the economy with these strong balance sheets, turning them into strong savers. Um, and two is like, where is the role of this productivity growth jump that you're seeing in lieu of the hours dropped on the wage side from in theory, like, you know, artificial intelligence, allowing Gaia to do a 30 webinars a week. <laughs> I mean, so where does that come in? Well, uh, with one less no, employee. So I, I have no doubt that we're all much more productive. I, I'm exhausted, right? But I'm, I think I've been more productive. Um, yeah, you look, higher interest rates, if you've got money in the bank, you're going to have more money to spend. I, yeah, I get that. And and that is in the indicators. It's not like the indicators are immune to that, right? Well-designed leading indicators uh, are wise to to that positive impulse, uh, but it's um, offset. You know, it can be offset. It's not all a positive, right? So if you if you, um, that, that cost of capital for, uh, risk taking can be, become prohibitive, right? And we're seeing, uh, that begin to happen. It's, it's, it, it maybe took a while or maybe it's already happened. We just don't realize it. Uh, but there, there seem to be signs of, of, uh, pressure. You're going to have margins being squeezed. I'm talking about the overall economy. Right, we have to differentiate from whatever the dozen uh, uh, mega uh, kind of uh, uh, AI or tech companies that are going to have a very different experience. Um, but if you're a kind of a capital intensive uh, industrial, there's it's very hard. You're, it's very hard to 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 open your margins up on this right in the short term. AI for productivity, I'm all in, you know, I'm not going to argue with that, but, uh, I also have to acknowledge that productivity growth stinks. I mean, I know the story 
is very promising. And I know we can point to all the podcasts that Michael is doing, right? But overall aggregate productivity growth is no good. Uh, and that's not just in the United States. That's pretty much globally. I mean, maybe we, I would, we could put India and Africa to the side, <clears throat> but I'd say a lot of the rest of the world is struggling with their trends and productivity growth. And for that matter, with population growth. And these things are going to weigh on longer term growth. Now, AI is going to play a role in mitigating that AI driven productivity. Um, but uh, we were looking at some charts uh, a few months ago, uh, and there's a whole host of reasons for this, but it takes two construction workers today to do the job that one would have done in the 90s. And that's the that's the fact. If you right. look at the numbers. From the, the safety perspective, et cetera, right? There's reasons for that. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and it, it's hard to have productivity growth the way it used to be. Uh, productivity growth has been coming down. Uh, it's, a, it's a hard one to say this is why. Re safety and regulation, maybe there's a benefit for that. And so, the, so you, you, you have to do a little extra work. I'm not saying that's untrue. But we also had a lot of experienced people leave the 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 job market there um and get replaced by less experienced people um you've all you've also had you know i don't i don't i i don't know exactly what that may have infected you know maybe it's the uh maybe it's the smartphone but it's it's something has 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 ha has eaten away at the productivity growth that we used to have and it's not only in construction uh, or manufacturing. It's, it's even to the extent we can measure it in, in the services sector. So those trends are not great. So let's say productivity goes up from abysmal negative growth rates to 1%. If, uh, you know, you, that, means, that means you're still having trouble making ends meet if you've got inflation running at 3 or 4%. Right? So these numbers aren't great and certainly the adoption or figuring out how to get that productivity out into the overall economy is going to take years that's not happening anytime soon this cycle will be history by that it's not going to impact this cycle so when i when i look at the, the globe today I, I struggle both with what's happening in china as potentially a negative to the economy. But then I also see what's happening with India. And so much great stuff is happening yeah. in India. You know, and, and and I think one is set up to take over the other, right? I, I'd be i I'd be curious to know your 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 views on those two economies in the potential over the next five years of how that race thing oh i will yeah i'm biased i'm going to, okay i'm gonna, I'm, okay. gonna uh, I must i mean even if i try to check my bias uh you know my dad's from india so i'm gonna i am fond of india the but i think there's um first we on this level when you go when you go u.s india china like that you've got to bring in the geopolitical and uh so we're matched up against China and more friendly with India, and that's the way it is. And uh, and and so I think that trade opportunity with India is very good on that score. And they're and it puts India in a really interesting spot, right? Because they 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 kind of straddle the middle. They try not to fall too much to what either the east or the west side. Um, and so they can always kind of, you know, get a little bit better deal. <laughs> and that's what they've been, that's what they've been, uh, I think largely doing now. I don't think India is going to be the big manufacturing powerhouse the way that industrially, right. That China was, but, um, there, there is going to be kind of two steps forward, one step back on, on the tech stuff. And, and that, that kind of involvement, which is, you know, higher value add stuff. 
they they have um very young very you know great demographics they can they still have lots of people who need to be brought into the banking system and take advantage of all the beautiful credit and all these things they've done the whole jump while we were kind of freaking out over Brexit or whatever, they just uh, went ahead and kind of digitized their whole monetary system. I mean, it's kind of crazy when you think about it, and it's huge. It's a, it's a real they a really beneficial fraud. They yeah no, the friction is low. They've got they're kind of built for this century for the rest of the century where we're trying to figure our way through that from the legacy systems, and so. Um, I think they're a great, but they're not big enough. Here's the problem, right? They're not going to solve the problem, right? So China opens up and Wall Street has a sigh of relief because they think, oh, China's going to spend a ton of money and, you know, buy all the oil and the copper and it's going to go up. And it's not that it just doesn't work that way. I don't think it's going to work that way in this higher inflation environment. It's tougher. You know, last decade, you, you're importing all this disinflation from China. You can get away with a lot of different policies that you can do now. So here, uh, India's got this very good kind of homegrown story of, of emerging. Uh, and look, there's, it's messy. It's a democ it's a messy democracy. It's functioning, uh, for the most part. And, and, and so it could get a little weird and we may not understand it from afar. Uh, but I think it's, it's moving in the right direction. The, the difficulty, right, is that these emerging markets uh, which, uh, are, are, are really at the, they're still tethered and at the whim of the, the Fed. I mean, if we start to, you know, get in trouble, do something funny, have to make quick moves, it, it can be destabilized. Um, and so I, I have to think about uh, again, my experience with cycles. I walk into this in the in the nineties, and if you'll recall, Greenspan, was there. Uh, and he happened to be a student of my mentor, uh, and so he was pretty good with cycles. And he did some things in the nineties that were very in tune with inflation cycles and sensitive to inflation cycles. Some of the testimony he and Bob McTeer. Were very keen on leading indicators of inflation. They they didn't go for these Phillips curve kind of approaches, <clears throat> and they made some moves that surprised the market quite a bit. In '94, you remember the huge bond bear market when they hiked, and then in '95, even when CPI was going up, they cut. So they were doing things that were out of the consensus view, but that I believe contributed to a pretty long expansion in the 90s, which uh, was happening when there was inflation, right? There were positive interest rates. There were all of these things. And we and we ended up uh, actually with a budget surplus at the end of the decade uh, and, and a lot of people employed and so on and so forth. Not so bad. Uh, you know, I mean, this is 20 something years ago. Now um, you get into Bernanke and Yellen and they're much more model driven much more phillips curve driven uh, that kind of place and when they find themselves in an environment with low inflation um the kind of impulse is yeah we can keep rates low we, we're going to keep them super low we're going to spend we're going to deficit spend um and when we have a crack up like the financial crisis um and inflation's low we're going to do they went through so many QEs that they got to QE eternity because rates were low. You can't do that now, right? So we're in a different world than then. And it's interesting because so Powell comes in, and this is ancient history, but you'll remember, or I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you remember in 2018, he's hiking rates because um, he thinks inflation is a problem. And the market crashes right around now, right around Christmas, right? Uh, and uh, he turns around and it's the famous Powell pivot. And then he goes on a listening tour or whatever they said. And he's trying to figure out, what do I do? Because that was a real screw up. 
and concludes that the that their structural disinflation is here to stay. Okay, so my environment is low inflation. On top of that, the Phillips curve is so much flatter than I thought it was. So even if unemployment is low, I don't really need to worry about it. And so that is the mindset that was, that was the playbook that was in place in 2020 coming uh, out of COVID. And so that's where you get all that idea that it's transitory. It's not going to stick around. Don't worry about it. Nothing to see here. It shows you how much opinion has changed over time. I remember one asset manager gave out uh, one Christmas this tie with Ben Bernanke throwing money out of a helicopter. <laughs> it was really funny. He was like, we're all celebrating it. You should save that. Um, never bring it back. I wish I, you know, I was actually just thinking about it. I was like, oh, wish I still had that. Um, you have it. You know who I'm talking about then. Uh, so we are wrapping up soon. I'm going to ask one last question. Uh, some economists have said that a lot of the fiscal stimulus that was experienced during COVID um, is now the basis of many studies as to how our economy is going to perform in the base of like UBI and things of that sort in the future. Um, do you have any thoughts on that topic or if not, I can ask another question. Well, I would say, I, you know, the, the problem with the premise is that there's, we're still just finishing all that backwash of COVID, uh, uh, volatility. And so everything was done so abruptly and, and massively, um, at a time when there was this structural cut to the labor supply. So now most of that labor supply stuff has, has eased off, at least from the extremes. Okay. And if you do spurts of money, first off, I think the bond market vigilantes will get interested. Um, second, so the interest rates, I, I'm not exactly sure that that goes smoothly. And, and second, the problem with the spurts in money, if you, um, I'm reminded, we did a presentation year, a few years ago on QE stuff where we talked about the red queen effect. I remember through the looking glass and it's kind of the crazy world. And um, the red queen uh, points out that you have to run twice as fast just to stay in place. So, okay. <clears throat> give me a hundred bucks. Okay, great. I feel good. I'm going to go spend a hundred bucks. Now I come back and you give me a hundred bucks. I'm like, man, can you give me a little more than that? And more than that and more than that. And, um, you end up at, you know, kind of where we are, right? These are big numbers that we have in terms of debt and deficit. Uh, and I've been surprised to a degree on how far they've pushed it. So I'm, prepared to be surprised again that they'll push it even further, but there is some limit there. Uh, and, um, I get concerned again around inflation cycles. If this bottom in whatever inflation downturn we're having is higher than the earlier one, go back and look at your charts of the seventies. It, it doesn't end well, right? So you could see it's a, it's just a bunch of lower, higher lows. And then um, it hits the fan. And so, and, and it's interesting in the seventies, right? So in the early part of the seventies, people didn't care. They were like, yeah, higher inflation is fine. And, but then there was a point where they cared and, and, you know, talk therapy, you, the people are hurting. There's a crisis of, of, uh, inflation here in the sense that wall street gets all excited because it goes from whatever, four to three on its way to two. But everybody else is like, what are you talking about? It still costs me six bucks for a coffee. That's crazy. You know, that's insane. My, a used car costs 10, 10 something, you know, come on. And, and that's the real life that everybody's living. And um, they're starting to get pissed off. Yeah. And, and along those same lines, people don't know when the price is going to go down. And there is disincentive to see that price go down. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, there, there's disincentive to see the price go down. Yeah, I agree with you. The, and businesses right now, right, they're loaded up. They had a tough time, right? They have some 
muscle memory of not being able to hire people or having to hire people that they normally would not have hired for this job. And they're like, I just need a body. I'm going to put them in there. And, and now, um, the numbers aren't adding up, right? Your margins are going to start to squeeze here, but they already are. And let's watch for when the firings start. Um, oh, but the S&P is going to actually hit $250 in earnings next year, finally, which we've been predicting for four years. So it's going to happen in the face of all this. Well, you know, your S&P earnings looks, you can have overall earnings going up in a weird way. It's Look, we are in Alice in Wonderland stuff, right? So you can have some earnings go up. In particular, if you don't have that many employees and you are, uh, you know, automated or teched up and, and you can't, you can play that game. You're, you're going to, um, be able to make some money. There's going to be some big winners in this environment, but for the masses, you were, uh, Dan, you were asking like, oh, are you doing regions of the country? I'm talking about the entire country, hundreds of millions of people. And that aggregate, uh, is getting is getting squeezed. That aggregate is not becoming more productive. The productivity growth is not going up really fast there. Uh, and that's squeezing your margins. And so um, I think the employers have done a lot. They've done everything they could do except fire people. Big companies actually have started to fire people. Smaller companies, which were having a tougher time hiring, they're getting the squeeze here now. And we'll, and we'll see where it goes. We're at the uh, top of the hour. I know yeah. you've got to get going. So appreciate everybody that joined. Everybody, please make sure you come back to other episodes of Get Thing Tank. Make sure you also follow Lockman, Lockman yep. on uh, economic, economic Cycle, right? Business Cycle? Economic, yeah, Economic Cycle Research Institute. We're on LinkedIn, and we started up a newsletter, which I think is pretty good. And you can just click and get it there, or businesscycle.com. And, and you can also see things there. All the things I just talked about, there's nice charts there if you want to look at them. Thank you for joining. We'll see you next time on Get Think Tanked.